Good morning. Welcome to today's Center for Healthcare Careers of Southeastern Wisconsin's See Yourself in Healthcare presentation. My name is Devonna Williamson and I will be your host. Um, today's presentation is sponsored by uh, Advocate, Aurora, Advocate Aurora, Ascension, Children's Health Wisconsin, and Freighted Health. Um, a few housekeeping items. We are recommending that if you have a mobile phone that um, you have it prepared for an activity that we have a little later on in the presentation, um, you will want to go to www.kahoot.it towards the end of the presentation. So again, feel free to load that up right now. It's K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. Again, www.kahoot.it. And that way you'll be ready to go when it's time for us to play our, our game. Uh, if you do have any questions, and we recommend that you, you know, feel free to share those, uh, put them into the chat box, and I will ask them of our speaker um, at, the, at the right time. Um, today's topic is going to be medical coding. And we are lucky enough to have Christina Wheelwright from Freighter Health here to share her vast knowledge of the medical coding field. Christina, welcome, and tell us a little bit about you. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm Christina Wheelwright. I'm the Director of Coding Services for Freightert Health. Um, I've been with Freightert for six years now almost. Um, I work remotely from Ohio, so I'm not located in Wisconsin, though I do come up to Wisconsin sometimes. Um, prior to Freightert, I was at Cincinnati Children's Hospital for 15 years in a variety of different roles, most of them revolving around coding and compliance. Uh, and before that, I did some consulting work and then it gets really old. <laughs> it's not relevant, <laughs> but it's really wonderful to be a freighter. It's a wonderful place to work and coding is a really growing field and um, our department's expanding and taking on more responsibility. So it's an exciting time to be there. Great. Wonderful. Well, we appreciate you joining us as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question with two parts. One is tell us a little bit about some of the things that you do on a day-to-day. -day. I know you're a director, so you're probably not doing actual coding, but also maybe tell us what a typical coder would do on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, you're right. I don't do very much coding because when I do, they make, then my staff makes fun of me because I'm slow <laughs> now. I'm, I used to be a really good coder. Um, but on a typical day-to-day, -day, I am primarily involved in um, kind of strategic planning initiatives, um, expanding our scope, doing some compliance issues, uh, working with different departments, building relationships, um, and that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm, I do a little bit of the daily operations, but um, I have a management team that's very skilled and they take care of all of that. Um, and they do a fantastic job. Uh, a typical coder, um, it, it, we've got so many different coding areas that it's really exciting. We really believe in cross-training our staff to keep them you know, interested in what they're doing. But what a coder does is they go through a, a medical record of a patient uh, note by note and with their knowledge of coding guidelines and rules and regulations, um, they apply those rules to what they're reading, the, the patient's clinical condition. So it takes that knowledge of rules, regulations, coding guidelines, um, and then you also obtain through you know, education and training a knowledge of the clinical side. So you know when you read the patient's what the physician is doing to the provider, whether you assign a code to that procedure or that diagnosis. Um, so it's kind of like, um, it's a treasure hunt. It's a, it's like a mystery that you're solving all of the time. And you, you know, by the time you get to the end of the record, you come up with a way to reflect that patient's condition and what happened while they were here in a matter of codes. So kind of um, maybe taking something from one language and putting it into a different language. That's the perfect way to describe it. That's exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, only they, they are English, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to learn that part too, right? Right. But exactly. that is exact. Yeah. And those codes drive data and, you know, it, it allows us to pull that information then from a database because you, you can pull on those codes. Okay, great. So what sort of training or education is needed for this position? What kind of training do you have? Um, I have my Bachelor's of Science in Health Information Management from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, 
and and you can go that route and get a bachelor's. It's usually recommended or required for a leadership position. Um, although, you know, not always an associate's degree sometimes is just fine if you're looking for the right candidate and they know their stuff, you know, it's, it's, it's all about that. But um, uh, an associate's degree is usually required for the higher levels of coding. Um, if you want to get into complex inpatient care, which is kind of what our freighter main campus has, you, you know, level three trauma centers and stuff. When you're dealing with patients who have been in the house, you know, six months, it, it, you, you really you <laughs> have to get into it. It takes, it can take days to do one case. Um, but there's also a route to go with AAPC and you take some courses online, you do an apprenticeship, you get a certification. Um, so there's also that route too. Um, so it can, it can range bachelor's associates um, or the certification route. I mean, you get credentialed um, in any of those avenues though. You know? okay. Great. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, when you think about coding, um, which sounds like you do day in and day out, <laughs> all day, every day, <laughs> um, what sort of skills or abilities are really useful in that career? What makes someone successful at being a coder? I think you have to be a very good critical thinker. You have to think of it. It's not black or white. You really have to take your knowledge set and, and apply your best judgment to the scenario that's taking place in front of you. So really critical thinking is huge. And I would also say communication skills because as, in the coding profession, you're dealing with so many different areas. You're dealing with physicians, nurses, um, finance, uh, quality. <laughs> so, you know, just being able to communicate with all of those different, um, you know, levels of people doing different things in, in a way that, you know, they respect what you're asking them to do. And um, so that's very important communication. Um, Self-starter too. Yeah, I mean, I think you, to pay attention to a record, you really have to enjoy that research and that um, you have to enjoy that, which I do. I think it's fun. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned physicians, you mentioned mm -hmm. finance and um, quality. Mm -hmm. do, you, do coders ever interact with patients? Not so much. Um, in general, if a patient complaint should come through and it has to do with perhaps a code assignment or a question about a code assignment, um, then, you know, a, a, one of the coders may call them back. Um, but in general, no, not really. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, customer service internally versus customer service externally. Exactly. And that's, we still get um, evaluated on our customer service. Our customers are at house, right? Mm -hmm. So what sort of suggestions would you have or would you give to someone who is in high school or heading off to college maybe mm -hmm. um, and they were thinking about a career in medical coding? I think I would most recommend if learn your anatomy and physiology, pay attention to that. Um, and do research when you don't understand something. That was the biggest thing I learned. I, I was very um, overly confident of myself when I started coding <laughs> my first job out of college and it brought me to tears real fast. <laughs> but, you know, just, just put in the time and really learn it and know when you don't know something and, and that's okay. It's okay to say, I don't know, I'm gonna go look it up. You know, that's what makes a good coder is not just taking a stab at it, just saying, taking the extra 10 minutes, using your reference material and your resources and, and just go find out, you know, um, that would be my biggest suggestion. So you touched on this a little bit, but what mm -hmm. sort of setting do coders typically work in? Are they always going to be in a hospital sitting somewhere coding or? Um, that's a good question. There are so many different settings. Um, I, you, I have worked on a nursing unit, right? Side by side with physicians and stuff. Um, I'm sorry, there's like a fly in here. <laughs> Figures. <laughs> uh, my window's open. Um, so yeah, you could end up on a nursing unit, though that's, you know, less and less now um, in the hospital in a, in a coding department. Um, most of the time, though, now it's remote. Um, we have coders all over the country now that work for our department. We have people in Utah and Georgia, um, Tennessee, everywhere. And that's just been the growing trend of that. Um, you know, back in the day, you'd hop on a plane if you were a consultant on Monday and fly back on Friday. Um, but now it's pretty much remote. And that, that would be the biggest 
area. There's also coders that work in physicians' offices as well. So you could work for a physician, a huge physician um, practice. Um, so yeah, it, it depends. Some people prefer to work on site and some people prefer remote too. So a lot of departments offer both. Great, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm gonna ask a question. Um, yeah. <laughs> the question is, why is coding important to healthcare? Mm. You know, why, why would someone want to go into coding? How does it help healthcare? Right. That's a great question. Um, so it's tied to a lot of things that, you know, you don't even realize sometimes until you actually get out in the field. I mean, you can learn about it in school and then you get in there and you're like, oh, wow. Um, it really does drive a lot of things. So uh, first, it drives the reimbursement. Um, you know, the, depending on the codes you assign and you have to do it compliantly, that is how you get paid by most payers, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, all, most commercial insurances now. Um, it's all driven off the code assignment. But in addition to that, it drives data. So when you're looking at, you know, our Vizient rankings or uh, U.S. World and News and World Report or whatever, um, I should know that. I was on their data team for a while, but um, it drives a lot of that data that links your performance. Um, it also, um, it drives like performance improvement initiatives. So we pull the coded data if we see a trend in patient care that may not be the way we want it to go. And we can we can abstract that data and kind of trend it based on the codes. Like, are, are we seeing this with patients, you know, in a certain disease category? Or um, are these patients more prone to this, you know, comorbidity? So it drives a lot of the data and decision-making. Um, so yeah, so you, you that's, that goes back to you end up working with a lot of different people because they're like, oh, you know, we need to find this out. What kind of codes would we use? Very cool. So uh, how the company gets paid, how the physicians get paid, how the nurses get paid, how mm -hmm. a, a CNA gets paid, it comes off of how it was billed. And of course, as you're saying, we have to bill legitimately, right. but you need to make certain <laughs> that you are charging appropriately for the services and the care that was needed. And then also you're able to track how many cases of sickle cell do we have, which affects mm -hmm. a certain population typically. Um, so the kind of um, care that is needed and, and increases and decreases in that, that kind of care that's needed mm -hmm. is something that your team helps. Yes. Track. It, yes. And we, and we help, um, we help our like enterprise analytics team if they get a request from a clinical division and they, you know, the clinical division will come with a question. Why are, you know, all the patients with sickle cell, are there, is there a reason that, you know, we are having so many sickle cell patients with, you know, that end up with pneumonia or something. And you can kind of see from the code set, what else is going on? Well, you know, this patient, those patients day. also had, yeah. Or, yes. Okay. Yeah. Very, cool. Very yeah, cool. That's I love that part. <laughs> so we did get um, a question online that said that if you're working remotely, what mm -hmm. sort of shift do you work? And I guess that would be remote or in hospital. Like, mm -hmm. are they all first shift? And is it eight hours or is it a flexible? How does how that typically work for coders? It depends where you work. Um, we are very flexible. We allow you people, to, our coders, to work any time of day whatever works for them. Um, we do like them. We, we don't like people to work 14 hour days because that's not good for anybody. Uh, <laughs> so we prefer, you know, five, eight hour days, but you know, or four tens, or if you want to do two days on the weekend and two days during the week. Um, and I think a lot of places more and more are offering that kind of flexibility because as long as the work gets done, as far as coding goes, it doesn't necessarily have to be at a certain time. It's it's not a customer facing um, situation. So, yeah, you know, it's more of the background project work and, and whether I mean sometimes even as a leader, sometimes I you know may work eleven in the morning till ten at night, um, just based on what I have to do too. So yeah, we try to a lot of a lot of flexibility, and I think a lot of places do. Well, one of the questions that came through, and I don't know if you would know the answer mm -hmm. to this or not, and it may differ on if you're inpatient or outpatient mm -hmm. coding, but they were curious about the wage of, of coders. Um, they were specifically, say, starting um, wage, but I don't know if you know, Irene. Yeah, it, it does. It does matter. Um, um, but right out of the gate, gosh, I just looked at this too. This is embarrassing. Um, I would say the starting rate is about $25 an hour. 
Um, but with minimum wages going up, like freighters moving to an $18 minimum wage, um, I expect that to shift up too. But I would say, you know, definitely 25 an hour, easy, yeah. Um, and then, you know, it can go up until I've got coders who make at 40 bucks an hour. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. Um, one other question that I had for you, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, obviously you're a director, so leadership mm -hmm. is a direction that people can go into in coding. And you, you touched on this a little bit before, but is everyone doing the same kind of coding? You suggested no. And what other sort of things can you do in coding or mm -hmm. with coding? Yeah, there is a lot to do. Um, and, and you can some people don't want to do anything else. We try to uh, meet our staff's needs and, and, you know, as much as we can instead of vice versa. Um, so I have met with people who have been there for 20 years doing the same kind of coding outpatient clinic, and they're happy. They love their job. They like to read those notes. They know the doctor's notes, and that's great. I encourage, you know, that's fantastic. But otherwise, you know, we try to float between outpatient services or um, like an emergency department coder can do some outpatient surgery coding and vice versa. Um, so you get that mix of different patient case, you know, loads. Uh, inpatient coding is kind of specific though. Like there's a big difference between inpatient and outpatient like you kept touched on. Um, so outpatient very rarely, I mean, there's very little back and forth there because inpatient coders can't do that so well and it's just not efficient um and as far as the inpatient coders they see a variety of services they are pretty much just doing inpatient coding but they're doing trauma they're doing transplant they're doing uh you know heart surgery they're you know so mm -hmm. from case to case it's a very different mix of cases um and the, yeah so great Wonderful. Thank you. So we have one more question that came in on the chat. And then okay. just as a, a heads up for everybody, get your uh, phones ready, um, because we will be going to the Kahoot after this. Again, www.kahoot.it is where you're going to need to go. But first, the question that we got for you, Christina. Yeah. Um, and you touched on this a little bit, but if you can maybe just delve in a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Do you need an associate's degree or what other training programs kind of exist out there for someone to get into coding? If you want to get in quickly, I would say go to AAPC um, and there is a, a certification. You can get a certified professional coding or certified procedural coder. Um, or, and they have a couple of different ones, but you could, they, I believe it's all online. And then you, I think, do a certain amount of apprenticeship time. Um, but you, you don't need an associate's degree to do that. And, you know, if you want to run with that, like you can build your own um, expertise, you know, it, just be good at it. You do your research and, and get the, the general foundation down you know, and if you like it, you'll start delving into it and your experience will start to speak for itself. Uh, just just be open to trying different things. And that is another thing. Like as a coder, if you're starting out, take it, take every experience you can get. Um, go out. Don't be afraid of it. Like I, I went and started learning uh, professional coding in my 30s and I, I, I was scared, but I was like, oh, I, but I want to know it. So I went out on a limb and it just made me a better coder, well-rounded coder. So just do it. Um, but yeah, start there. Go out to that website and look around. Like you can see like what kind of courses are involved. Um, I think AHIMA also offers a certification program like a, without getting an associate's degree too. So AAPC or AHIMA, which is A-H-I-M-A, -A, yes, um, are pages that you could go out to, to just mm -hmm. kind of learn a little bit about courses that are offered and how people can get yes. a certification that isn't an associate's or right. a bachelor's in your case. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, it, it'll kind of outline what kind of courses are involved and, and it gives you that information to see if it's, if it's something that's interesting, but it, it is an interesting field. I, I encourage it. <laughs> You've been doing it for a little while, so there must be something. Right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so. yes, I have. <laughs> um, all right. Well, wonderful. So we are now going to go to the game side of our activity. Um, the pin that you're going to enter when the screen changes is 7946731. Again, 7946731. And we should see our screens change shortly. 
And then there's some fun music that comes on too. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I'm, I'm easily entertained. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Let's see here. And um, while we work on getting that technology working mm -hmm. and, and running for us, I, mean, I did have another question for you Great. Um, that I had set up for myself over here. Yeah. Um, I know we talked again about the associate's degree. Associate's degrees are typically two mm -hmm. years. Bachelor's are typically four years. Mm -hmm. So do you know for like these certifications it, from the, you know, the AAPC or, or AHIMA? Yeah. Are you go how long you're going to school or how long the studying typically is? I think about a year. Okay. I, I, I think it's about a year. I think the courses, and then I'm not sure about, I, I don't really know that much about the AAPC apprenticeship. I should have looked that up before I came. I apologize. Um, but I, I do think that that's about a year too before you can get your certification. Um, but I, I would say about a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's, yeah. that's a and short a period of time to walk into a career. It is. And a lot of times, I mean, us, we will, um, if you're finishing up your program, uh, we have hired people at an entry level coding position, knowing, you know, with the understanding that in six months, they'll complete their education and, and take the test and pass it or a year or whatever, you know, but, um, and I think, again, more and more people are doing that because they see the benefit of training up coders who are interested in doing this. Right. Makes sense. Definitely mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, looks like our Kahoot is loading and looks like we have a lot of people who are um, ready to play. Um, and we are going to oops, get started. A um, lot of fun nicknames on here <laughs> that have been created for people. Um, 22 people playing. So we are going to get started with, <clears throat> I think, the first question medical coding question. Medical coding requires a knowledge of medical terminology, anatomy and physiology, healthcare reimbursement, or all of the above. Medical terminology, anatomy and physiology. Okay, all of the above, we've got 23 people out of, must be 27, um, have voted, and that is the correct answer. You need to know all of those things in order to be successful in coding. All right. Let's see here. And Silly Tiger looks like got in a little bit faster with all of those answers than everybody else, than Tropical Swan, Smart Deer. We have a Flying Wallaby in here as well. <laughs> Let's go to the next question. True or false? Coders work on site, hospital, office, or remotely. Is that true or is that false? We've got 23, 25, 6. One more answer needed, maybe? Or 7 seconds. 6 seconds. All right, everybody's answered. And most people got it right. The answer is true. You can work in the office, in a hospital, or you can work from home. Like Ohio, I think is where Christina said she is. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Silly Tiger is still the quickest one in by a part of a second. Smart Deer is still up there. We've got a brave hamster in there now. Um, <laughs> so, all right, let's go on to the next question. <clears throat> which is also true or false. Coding rules are the same for all patient visits, inpatient, office, emergency, et cetera. Answer for that true or false? Okay, 27 answers are in. All right, the answer is false. General, the processes are the same, but what can be coded for in one setting versus what can be coded for in a different setting is what makes that a false answer. 
Uh, right, Christina? <laughs> yeah. And there's two, I, I should have, I, that's almost unfair. I didn't really touch on it, but yeah, there's two separate um, Cody sets used depending on uh, which area you're in. So yeah. Okay. okay. But the idea, the process is the same. You're right. Okay. All right. So um, 21 got the correct. Silly Tiger is at the top, followed by Smart Deer, proving that they are smart. Uh, <laughs> um, and then Rocky Lion is still in there, Friendly Lion, Bronze Condor. All right. <clears throat> Glad Lemming is climbing up there. Coding impacts, reimbursement, quality reporting, performance improvement project, all of the above. Again, coding impacts, everybody got their answers in. All right. <clears throat> Most of us got it. Looks like we had another person join. And all of the above is the answer. It affects reimbursement, quality reporting, as we were talking about, and performance improvement projects. Great. Silly Tiger and Smart Deer still on top. Bronze Condor and Golden Llama. Great. And five players hit a, three, a streak of three correct answers. Woohoo. <laughs> all right. True or false? Medical coding jobs are projected to grow faster than the average career growth rate. True or false? <laughs> and the answer is true. Coding is a definitively needed and growing area um, and we're going to keep growing, Christina, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it is a field to go into if you have, you know, that desire to research and, you know, detail and, um, you know, that ability to communicate as Christina was referring to. Yeah. It's a really good career for people who are interested in uh, medical stuff, but don't want to take care of patients. There you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Silly Tiger is on top, again, followed by Smart Deer, just by one point behind bronze condor friendly lion and golden llama at the top five players have gotten four correct all right last question true or false medical coders and medical billers perform the same job And the answer is false. The billers do something different than coders. Christina, can you, can you identify a little bit? What yeah. The difference so medical, and the reason I put this in there is you'll see um, both, you know, a lot of times are offered by the same, you know, um, schools in the same program lines, but they're very different. So, you know, make look into both and make sure you know what you're getting into. So where the coders are more focused on um, reading that record, understanding the clinical information that's going on and assigning those codes, the billers really know the billing rules. They're going to know what payers pay what, how this payer has to, you know, receive their claim they're more on the back end. So we code it and they do their magic before it goes out the door. Great, wonderful, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. And Smart Deer came up from number two <laughs> to uh, number one. And Good job, guys. Tiger and Bronze Condor. Six out of six correct for all three of you. Great job. Future coders. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there we go, great, wonderful. Well, thank you so much um, everyone for you know, taking a second or two to, uh, you know, do that activity. Um, the uh, the only um, other question that I had for you, and you, you've touched on this a little bit, but I actually want to kind of tie it into the answer that you just gave regarding um, billing. Mm -hmm. If someone wanted to go to school for coding, mm -hmm. does it help if they start a job that maybe is doing some billing? Yes. Um, okay, so... Absolutely. If you wanted to, that would be a great way to become familiar with the revenue cycle of a hospital and understand you're going to see the codes, you're going to, you, you gain some familiarity of what they mean and who does what with them and where to go, you know, when there's an issue with them. Um, 
So I, I think that is a great way if you want to just start to see if that's even something you're interested in. And those are really good positions too. A lot of those are going remote. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, a lot of places offer tuition reimbursement. So if you wanted to be a medical biller and take your tuition reimbursement, um, that's another opportunity too. Um, but yeah, it is a, it's a really, we're so closely tied. Um, the billers report to a department called Patient Financial Services, and we're all under the same umbrella and we work together daily with <laughs> constant contact. Um, so it is a really good way to, to get familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Great. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, one question that has come through is how old do you have to be to take the certifications? I'm assuming you still have to be 18, like have a high school diploma, but yeah, I think you do have to have a, a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. equivalent. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Yeah, or equivalent. Absolutely. Okay. So if you go out to the AAPC or AHIMA, you will find that, that they're going to be talking about in order to join them, probably having a high school diploma. I'm, I'm pretty sure they would require, they require that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, looks like we may have some more questions maybe oh. coming through that they haven't quite loaded yet. Oh, okay. Oh, actually, nope, that was the last one. Okay. <laughs> that I have on there. Um, well, you know, uh, uh, Christina, we really appreciate you taking time today and, and share the importance of, of what coders do and maybe expose people to something in the healthcare field that they aren't as familiar with, mm -hmm. didn't know existed. Um, uh, we appreciate, you know, you taking time out of your day to do that. And we want to just let anybody know if you have any further questions, we can always get them to Christina. Um, if you reach out to Joan Ward, who helped get these um, meetings set up, these events set up, it's joan.ward at employmilwaukee.org. Again, joan.ward at employmilwaukee.org. And she would be happy to uh, get those questions over to Christina so that she can answer them. And I would love it. So anything, there is no dumb question. If you just want more information, I'm happy to guide you in the right direction. Um, but yeah, just, I really appreciate the opportunity to come out and, and tell people about coding because a lot of people don't know it and it is a good deal. So um, I hope I encourage you guys to look into it. And if you have, if you need anything, just please reach out. I really appreciate being here. All right. Wonderful. Um, All right. Well, thank you so much, um, Christina. Okay. I think you and I are going to stay here and everybody else is going to uh, head off into their day, um, day two after daylight saving time. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's why All I right. got my coffee. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. I know we're still on Christina, but you did see the lovely music that was making me bop, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> that was... <laughs> That's the music that I enjoy. <laughs> I like music. <laughs> like I, I said, just... I, I am easily entertained. <laughs> I just looked up and I realized like there's a sliver of light that's blinding. <laughs> Is that reflecting off my glasses?